in two minutes, so apologies for the delay. Organizations, Democracy Forward, and Leading Action. 
Mark is an active counsel in the Voting Rights and Research and Elizabeth Litigation Across the Country. He is general counsel to the National Democratic District Committee of Indiana in 2016. He successfully argued three cases challenging unlawful Republican gerrymandering in the U.S. Supreme Court. Mark Moss also serves on the AC Planning Committee on Election Law and as an advisor for two American Law Institute projects. Sitting next to Mark is Todd Cox. Todd is Director of Policy at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, of which I was an intern way back in 2001. So, we're all starting to get a low bar. Yes. I did. 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 Uh, before returning to the LDF, uh, Todd was the Director of Criminal Justice Policy at the Center for American Progress, and prior to that, he served in the Obama administration as the Director of the Office of Communications and Legislative Affairs at the U.S. EEOC. Todd has spent his career advocating for civil rights and social justice in a variety of positions, and started his career as an honors trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division of DOJ. Last, absolutely not least, is Julie Howie. Uh, she is a senior special counsel for the Voting Rights Project for the Workers and the Civil Rights Under the Law. Her practice focuses on litigation cases under the Voting Rights Act, the NVRA, and on cases seeking to reform election administration practices in the United States. She is an accomplished civil rights attorney and has handled civil rights claims arising from police misconduct, prison abuse, employment discrimination, and First Amendment violations. Last year, Julie played a key role in litigation advising on voter registration issues down in Georgia. As a result of her efforts, the voter registration deadlines were not arbitrarily imposed before the Georgia runoff election. That was a mouthful. We have an incredibly accomplished panel here today. So, again, without further ado, we can start with Ryan again. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for having us uh, and for that introduction. Um, um, again, my name is Ryan Newsom, I'm a staff attorney uh, with the ACLU, um, and I think my colleagues can probably speak very broadly about the voting rights um, and the, the many challenges that we face and a variety of funds um, in those issues. I think I, I want to speak mostly today about our recent experience in a case against Chris Kobach, uh, our Fishby Kobach case, the challenge that we brought uh, to uh, the Secretary of State's uh, document proof of citizenship law. Uh, I think there's a lot of lessons that we've learned from that. I think there's a lot of drama that we can sort of uh, 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 describe from that experience, and there's a lot of Good that can come even in this uh, 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 challenging landscape faced by uh, looking at some of the things that happened that occurred in that case. Um, so, the, the, as Jason mentioned, uh, the lawsuit is a challenge uh, against Chris Kobach's um, document proof for citizenship uh, law. Um, and we completed, we completed a trial at the end of March um, in this case. And I will say that. A trial is kind of intrinsically a dramatic uh, uh, event, um, but I, I'm not sure I have seen a trial that had some sort of level of drama, some sort of level of uh, intensity, or um, that put all the issues that we struggle with in the voting rights sphere on display virtually every day. Um, and it was a really unique opportunity, I think, I think to put, put not just this law that uh, Kansas is about, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about on trial, but to put Chris Kobach himself on trial and to put on trial all the claims that he's made about non citizens stealing our elections, about immigrants kind of hiding out in voting booths and um, uh, swaying the results of elections. Those uh, statements, those claims, those wild allegations, as we know, have gone up to the very highest levels of power to the President of the United States himself. And they've come, they've, they've come to his ears specifically through Chris Kobach. And this was a chance really to say uh, to, you know, to a court of law, to put those those uh, claims to the challenge, and, he was it, and uh, Chris, uh, I think, came up locally uh, uh, shorthanded, um, and, and it's a really great example of how there's a 
a lot, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a realm within the United States in the political sphere uh, uh, where certain advocates are, are used to sort of uh, acting like kind of used car salesmen uh, to, to launch pitches about what they think should be policy reform. And all of those plans, all of those allegations kind of melt away in the harsh light of a courtroom where you have to come up with real evidence, you have to follow the laws and procedures, you have to have some of the other claims. So, the, the, so just to back up a little bit, um, Chris Kobach is an adversary that many of us have faced in a variety of contexts. Um, he likes to call himself uh, the ACLU's worst nightmare. I think in reality that is actually the reverse. <laughs> I think our record is maybe something like seven to one in Boston's against Chris Kobach at this point. But, but two of his easiest hot horses are uh, extreme uh, uh, persecution of, of immigrants in the United States and suppression of the right to vote. And this law that he became Secretary of State in, I believe, 2010, and this was in the wake of the, uh, the Supreme Court's decision in uh, Crawford v. Marion County. And I think that Chris saw that as a green light, saw that as a green light, saw that as a green light to demand whatever documentation you could possibly request from any, at any stage of the voting procedure and base that on this kind of just concept that maybe it is possible that possibly someone could have been brought at some point. And so what he did, in addition to adopting a very strict voter ID law in the state of Kansas, um, which is uh, mirrors laws in various other parts of the, of the United States, he adopted another law for just the process of voter registration. So in order to register to vote, you have to show a, a passport or a birth certificate. Now, obviously, the voter ID laws that we can put up are already extremely burdensome on individuals, but these laws are, are yet another sort of level of burden because you know, I mean, so many people don't have their, their birth certificates, they don't know where they are, they're with parents, they've lost them, and uh, a minority of the United, of the United States citizens have a passport or any other document that can prove that they're citizens. But uh, in, in 2011, uh, Chris sold this to the Kansas legislature based on virtually nothing more than a set of kind of rumors and suppositions. There were the, the legislative testimony essentially said that there was a Muslim lady that someone had saw, I'm like not even exaggerating, that uh, a Muslim lady, someone had heard of a Muslim lady with an accent near a poll and asked it should vote in uh, two different jurisdictions. Um, there were there were uh, reports about a set of Missouri uh, uh, Somali immigrants who claimed to have been uh, uh, registering and legally vote. All of these stories were later researched and were debunked by Kansas reporters, by other reporters to see there was nothing behind them. But it was enough to push through this idea that you need to have a law in place to ensure that everyone is a citizen, um, just because it is in theory possible um, for someone to, uh, for a non-citizen to register to vote. Um, and, uh, and as soon as that law was enacted, it was immediately disastrous for ordinary voters. Um, within months, thousands of individuals registered in Kansas for whatever uh, mechanism they could find in Kansas weren't, uh, were, were not even able to get a polls because they didn't have uh, any a birth certificate or a passport that they could present, uh, or that because no one actually told them that was a requirement and they didn't discover it until they got to the polls and they were disenfranchised. Um, and Chris kept the list of the number of people who were uh, being uh, disenfranchised in every month. It was climbing and climbing by more thousands of people up to the point that approximately 30 to 40,000 registrants were being uh, um, uh, uh, blocked from, uh, from, uh, from the franchise. So we brought a lawsuit against him, and we brought a claim under the National Voter Registration Act. Um, in the 1990s, uh, the Congress passed a law. This is not a uh, uh, comparable in the voter ID uh, uh, framework, but specifically with the main registration is easy and straightforward. And in that, it's probably one of the voter law. Um, and in that statute, it says that a uh, state can only require only the minimum amount of information necessary in order to register, uh, in order to 
to evaluate non citizens, uh, to evaluate uh, um, uh, eligibility to be to become registered to vote. And we said that this law that was disenfranchising 30 to 40,000 people in the state of Kansas greatly exceeded that. In every other state of the union, um, everyone registers simply by swearing an oath of, of citizenship. You say, I'm a citizen, I'm swearing this under penalty of perjury. I'll prosecute it if I, uh, if I lie to you about this specific issue or I'm at risk of that. Uh, and that's enough. And we said that there's no evidence that anything more is needed in the state of Kansas. Um, so the secretary responded and said that uh, Briefly said that actually, no, the way you should read the statute is the minimum amount of information necessary is whatever I say is necessary, whatever the state thinks is necessary. And we ended up winning that decision um, at the district court on a preliminary injunction and then again at the Court of Appeals. Um, and the one thing I'll say uh, that I think is a really critical lesson for us, especially in comparison to some of the past voting rights work that we did, is that. Having plaintiffs with real stories to tell about how they were disenfranchised was just fundamentally a huge part of the, the victory that we had here. I think there's an incredibly strong just statutory argument we have uh, and legal argument we have, but we were able to locate plaintiffs, for instance, Mr. Fish, the name plan, who was born on a military base. He's an army brat, who's, and that military base is decommissioned. There's no way for him to actually get a birth certificate because the place where he was born doesn't exist anymore. And I still remember in that first preliminary injunction hearing, the judge saying, that man's story really resonated with me. That was one of the first questions she said. I've never heard a judge actually say that. She said, I grew up as a military brat, and I know that we don't always keep a hold of all of these documents, but you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be blocked from being able to register. Just because of that. Um, so after we uh, were able to get the preliminary injunction in place, the Tenth Circuit held a, a standard that essentially said the presumptive minimum that a state can have to register to, uh, demand to register to someone to vote is uh, is an oath of citizenship. You just swear that you're a citizen. But the the state has an opportunity to rebut that if they can demonstrate that substantial numbers of non-citizens have registered to vote in the state. It's basically a factual question. The case was remanded for the, for the court and for the bed to consider whether or not the uh, COBOC could come up with, it, with evidence. So when the, the trial that was just held in March was all about that sole question. Does Chris COBOC actually have evidence that non-citizens are registering? It was this one opportunity to put that forward into the um, into uh, the record and to have a trial on that issue. And I think the way that the trial unfolded, I, I still remember that the, in our in our set of opening statements, uh, Chris Kobach basically said, you know, the evidence will show A, B, C, D, and E. And I think by the close of that trial. I think basically he might have said, I, she could only say he got in half of E. It was, it was a total, it was a total route. And, and I say that not so much to brag about like our abilities as lawyers or anything, it was mostly to show how little was actually on the other side. And with a character like Chris, it's kind of amazing to see the imbalance between the extreme ego and arrogance that, uh, individual like that has about what the Constitution requires, what the law, what federal law requires, versus what he actually has to show. Um, and I think the, for, for all of us as lawyers, the trial was also pretty dramatic just to see kind of how much just the basic, uh, the basic ability to conduct a trial matters, the, the basic way, your knowledge of how to uh, evaluate the evidence, to cross-examine uh, contrary witnesses how crucial that is to, to convince the court and the public, all of the media who were there to see that you're right about the thing that you're claiming. And, and Chris didn't know how to do any of that. He didn't know how to, I think, cross-examine an expert witness. He didn't know how to put on his best evidence. He tried over and over again to ambush us 
with new new figures that shows that oh that all those forty thousand people who were uh, uh, disenfranchised, a lot of them moved or in theory were somewhere else, and all of those numbers are incredibly questionable. But the judge had so little patience at that point that she he already uh, boxed himself into a corner where there's no way that she was going to trust um, any of the things that he was saying. In addition to that, the, the experts that uh, Chris put on sort of show, were these amazing examples where uh, the, the, they had provided him an opportunity to sell on Fox News or in Breitbart News his theories of the you know thousands of individuals who were purportedly registered to, uh, to vote, and all of their testimony kind of collapsed immediately. There's this really famous moment where one of the uh, one of Chris Kobach's experts, um, uh, part of his the analysis that he did of individuals who were registered to vote was based on the on the uh, the the registrant's last name to see if they were Anglo-Saxon, if they were Western seeming or not. And our one of our fellow, one of our, our amazing Scotland fellow, Emily Jang, said, you know, we really need to push the, him on this in cross-examination. And at, and she added this question to the outline where she said, do you, would, you, would you code Carlos Murguia as a non-citizen name? And this was this awesome trap that she sort of laid for him. Uh, and th in fact, Carlos Murguia is the judge in the district court of Kansas. And of course, this expert didn't know anything about that. They said, yeah, I would, yeah, I would code that as foreign uh, sounding. There, I mean, that, there are so many problems with uh, the expert analysis that that is just one sort of little kernel that is easy to understand. But it, to see all of that unfold in real time is really powerful. The only other thing that I'll say about kind of the power of the trial is that, you know, the, the judge at the center of this is a, she's a Republican appointment. She's a very kind of judicious, she's a judge, judge. She's a moderate and very kind of sensible person. Um, and she uh, had a moment where she uh, uh, cross examined she basically asked some questions of uh, Chris Kobach's other expert, Hans von Stefanski, who's well known in our community as an extreme kind of proponent of, of um, uh, voter suppression mechanisms. And she, the, uh, there, there was a tension between the plaintiff's experts and the defendant's expert over what the meaning of fraud was. Um, our experts said, technically, we should look at the legal definition of fraud, which is intentional fraud. The few numbers of non-citizens we found, 39 over 20 years versus 30,000 uh, disenfranchised, a lot of those, we actually had evidence that those non-citizens didn't want to be registered. They told the Secretary of State, We're, I'm a non-citizen, I don't want to be registered, take me off. Um, and our experts said, this, these should not be considered real examples of fraud. These are mistakes that are administrative mistakes. And Hans von Stokowski said, no, I actually think if there's one non-citizen registered, that's corrupting the integrity of the, of the election uh, process. That's the destruction of the election, uh, of, of the, the individual's confidence in the electoral system. And so the, the judge really uh, engaged with him on that and said, so you say that that's your view, but what do you say about those 30,000 people who were disenfranchised by this law? It doesn't that sort of uh, uh, threaten the integrity of the electoral system? And Hans von Zukowski could not answer that question. And he dodged and weaved around it. And you could see her as a former prosecutor getting more and more angry. She said, you only care about this sort of theory of this. And if you really cared about the integrity of the electoral system, you'd have a real problem with this purported solution that uh, that disenfranchised 30 to 40,000 people. So at the end of the trial, um, uh, the judge issued us a, a, a major decision uh, basically saying that there was no evidence. There was no evidence uh, uh, viable evidence of, uh, that non-citizen voter registration fraud is a problem in this state. And that the that it is that the deep threat to the system was from the law itself, which was disenfranchising all of these individuals, which was confusing all of these people who were trying to register. She also held that it was unconstitutional, that the ACLU didn't bring a standard Anderson verdict back to balancing claim against the law. Um, another uh, another set of plaintiffs did, um, and she basically said the state has no real legitimate um, uh, explanation to support this, and 
in light of that, it, this is <laughs> unconstitutionally burdensome. And I think uh, it's a sort of signal moment for how kind of hard facts can help us versus some of the facial challenges that were brought in uh, earlier uh, eras. And this is obviously the only the first step uh, because the, the decision law will be uh, 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 appealed up by Chris and his colleagues, but it was a really powerful moment to have a record that's that strong and a deep set of factual findings from a judge who's really been that record. So that's all I'll say about that, and I'm happy to, to, to answer any questions. Um, sure. So I'm going to um, I want to start by taking a step back and, and positing the following um, hypothesis that people are free to agree or disagree. Which is that there are at least three major motivations for why we are seeing voting rights under the sun. Okay? The first is one that is the great uh, scourge of uh, and blight of uh, American history, which is without and out racism. Right? There has been a strain of, of lawmaking in this country that is aimed at largely preventing African Americans, but expanding beyond African Americans to Hispanics and others. Simply making it harder for them to vote or uh, disenfranchise them. So I think there's like one category of, of bad laws that are just racially, that just are born of racial act. The second is more, I think, is the newer, um, uh, uh, more uh, current uh, 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 motivation, which is basically um, Huxtorism and the boomer. Right, so Chris Kobach. Right, so Chris Kobach, I think, is motivated because he's got this ridiculous persona that he has developed. Um, it doesn't mean he's not also engaged in racist behavior, uh, but it's it's more it's more trying to advance his political objectives, make himself a spectacle, make himself a national figure and a hero among a certain segment of the population. I think. The current president of the United States might fit in this category um, when it comes to voting rights. I don't know that Donald Trump really thinks deeply enough about anything, but certainly not about voting rights to actually have an informed view one way or the other. It, it's part and parcel though, of his demonization of immigrants. So it's, it's not vote. It's not. It, it's not a keen interest in voting rights as such. It's, it's sort of a, trying to advance an overall political agenda. And then the third um, is to advance a partisan agenda. And so um, I want to focus on that third one um, because I think it, in some ways, obviously these overlap, but in some ways they're distinct. Um, from, from, from a partisan perspective, from 1965 to 2009, we basically had a bipartisan consensus to make voting easier. That doesn't mean, by the way, that there weren't still profound efforts to deny African Americans equal access to the franchise. But it means that in uh, on a bipartisan basis, states were making uh, absentee ballots more available, no excuse absentee ballots, beginning the, the process of expanding and using vote by mail, uh, early vote, um, uh, more kinds of convenient voting became much more the norm. And if you look, they were the norm in blue states and red states. You know, they, in fact, some of the states that were least adopting of these changes were states like New York, right? States that, uh, that, that have relatively low levels of convenient voting. And then you have states like Ohio, where even when you have Republican leadership, you know, what were, were engaging in the expansion of, of early voting. That all really changes on a partisan perspective in 2009. Uh, because after 2008, the Republicans wake up and they look and they see the what is now referred to as the Obama coalition of young voters, voters of color, um, first time voters. Um, and they realize that this, that, that all of the Democratic coalition, all of the Obama coalition, Benefit from uh, these these uh, these uh, enhancements to access to voting, and increasingly the Republican coalition, which is older and whiter, 
doesn't. Now, for some of you in the audience, that will strike you as like, well, isn't that such as it ever was? Um, no, in 1994, when when Republicans took control of the House, Newt Gingrich said, this is almost a direct quote, the only thing that Democrats have left is to scare old people. Okay? So actually, historically, from the New Deal on, old white voters were like the base of the Democratic Party. I mean, it doesn't mean that black voters weren't also, but, but like you you had this dynamic, you had historically a different, uh, or at least in recent history, where you had minority voters and old voters, social security, people who were focused on social security were more democratic, and you had younger voters, people who were more concerned about taxes, national defense, who were who were more like the Republican voters. That sort of all changes in the in the around the Obama um, uh, time frame. And um, you start to have this 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 new paradigm, and Republicans look at this and say we need to do something about it. Now, the most famous example of this was in North Carolina, in case you've all heard about, where they said they targeted African Americans with surgical precision. Absolutely true. Okay, um, uh, and that's probably the most pernicious um, uh, uh, recent example that, uh, that 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 immediately comes to mind. Um, but you see through a series of, of cases, a series of, of, of law changes and interpretive changes um, uh, since 2009, uh, efforts to sort of pick and choose which voters get easier access and which voters get harder access. So of course, the Texas ID case that people talk about where you know university IDs not allowed, hunting licenses allowed. Right, like so that's actually not it's not just a question of like whether there is an ID law. It's actually they're actually micro targeting it within that. There, they, which is why I mentioned the North Carolina case because one of the things about the North Carolina case is they didn't they didn't just say let's make a bunch of changes to voting make it harder. What they did is they scored a series of changes. They said here's here's like twelve things we could do. What will be the impact? of those 12 things on black voters and white voters. And then we're gonna choose the ones that are gonna have the greatest negative impact on black voters and not do the ones that will have the greater impact on, on white voters. And in North Carolina, I would submit, and this is you know, not a proposition that everyone in this room will agree with, and, I, and it's a complicated thing to unpack, but I would argue that in North Carolina, they were largely using race as a problem. Um, so they were targeting black voters for sure. I think they were targeting black voters in large measure, not entirely, but in large measure because they thought black voters would vote for Democrats and they were Republicans who didn't want that to happen. So they were scoring these changes to, 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 to target um, their electoral prospects. This, I think, has a really profound negative impact on democracy. And you know, everyone is very attuned to this question in the context of redistricting. Right, because in redistricting, kind of like it presents itself pretty directly. Like, are we letting partisan players, are we letting Republicans essentially gerrymander districts to disadvantage certain categories of voters against, again, I would argue, uh, typically black voters? Um, are, 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 we, are we sort of okay with that as a country? Right, and a lot of people, most people actually on the left and the right, are not okay with it. Um, uh, uh, at least as a matter of sort of their own their own sentiment, um, but that same targeting is taking place in the broader issue of voting rights. So I want to focus on two quick cases, and I'll be, I'll be very very fast about them. The first in the redistricting arena. Um, I'm going to leave partisan gerrymandering aside because we all have sort of Will versus Whitford. Sort of uh, hangover. Yeah. Uh, um, but there's a case that's been going on in Virginia, which um, uh, I brought many years ago, um, which is still going on, uh, called Bethune Hill versus Virginia, where the state of Virginia drew 12 majority minority districts in the state. Okay. There are 12 black members of the state. 
they are there are 12 majority minority districts um, uh, majority black districts in Virginia and the legislature which was controlled by Republicans said at the outset and when I said they said this at the outset I mean like they said this like they issued press releases they said it on the floor this was not something they were bashful about this was actually something they championed that they were going to require that every one of those districts be at least 55 percent black so there's a in the record there's an example of a district that was um, that the registrar in, in richmond wanted to unite reunite a precinct to make the election easier to administer so this to do with a precinct split at the local level that would have caused one of the districts to go from 55.1 percent to 40 to 54.9 and the Republicans said no. They all have to be 55% or greater. Um, that is an absolute requirement. And there's testimony in the record that basically they went to the various mm -hmm. black legislators and said, "You can try the district you want, but it has to be greater than 55%." Um, they did this because they recognized that if they kept all of those districts greater than 55%, they would bleach the surrounding districts. Um, and have fewer competitive districts that their members have to run. And that's, that's what the trial record says, it's what, what, what the trial court has, has done. Um, that's like, in some ways, and again, people in this room don't agree with it. To me, that's in some ways more horrifying than just saying, let's just, you know, create Democratic and Republican. Because it's actually using, they were championing themselves as the advocates of African American voters when, in fact, they were just engaged in a cynical effort to achieve a, a partisan, uh, a partisan outcome. <coughs> the second case I wanted to briefly touch on, which is actually my current obsession, so I'm going to like shoehorn this in into this conference <laughs> because it's my obsession. So, following 2016, I started looking at polling. Wonder why um, and accuracy. And one of the things I started um, uh, looking at was why, um, what the methodologies are. Not the samples. Most of this, the post 2016 analysis has been like, what who got polled, who didn't get polled, or did they poll too many non-college educated or college educated, whatever. Um, but I was interested in actually the methodology. And one of the things that was interesting is that. When pollsters call, they rotate who they call. They rotate the ballot. So in first, they call you and they say, are you more likely to vote for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? And they call you and they say, you're more likely to vote for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. They rotate them. And that's kind of a curious thing if you think about it. Like, why are you rotating that? And the answer is you rotate it because there's what's referred to as position bias. And in oral communications, there is what's known as the recency effect. The name you have, your last, is the most likely name you get back. It turns out in writing, the opposite of the recency effect takes its hold, which is the primacy effect, which is you give people a list of names, the more likely to choose the first one. So you have this oddity that you're rotating names to try to deal with one. And so the question is, like, what does it do for the other, right? For, for how people are some about. And I saw a presentation by a professor from Stanford, John Crossing, who actually turns out is the leading world's leading expert on position bias and developer. And it turns out there's like an enormous impact, like a really big impact. I'm doing Florida right now over this because in Florida, the Republicans be listed first in every race from governor, Senate, down to dog tiger on every ballot in every county in every race. So the question is like, what's the impact? It turns out it's like a 3% impact. So it's about a three point advantage to have the party listed first every time. So we're suing Florida over that. I've been evangelizing that. I've been running around telling everyone, you need to pay attention to ballot order effect because it's like three, it's like two to three percent depending on the race. Doesn't everyone in the room is like that doesn't make any sense? Who the hell votes based on the first person on the ballot? Turns out a lot of people. So this is now a digression from a digression. When Senator Menendez was on trial in New Jersey for public corruption, there was eight week long trial. Juror was jury was chosen from the voter rolls because that's how jurors are chosen in New Jersey. The first question after eight eight weeks of trial testimony from the jury was, "What is a senator?" Okay, plenty of people don't understand ballot. You don't go into the voting booth and they're not affected by ballot order. Ballot order has a real impact. 
the public who is voting is not nearly as attentive to all the ins and outs that folks um, in this room are. So uh, I brought this lawsuit in Florida, and then last week there was an article in the local newspaper in North Carolina. There's a woman named Anita Earls who is a voting rights activist, a voting rights lawyer, one of the leading voting rights lawyers in the country. Um, she's running for state Supreme Court in, in North Carolina. So the state of North Carolina has has passed a law to change the ballot order. And they changed the ballot order so that Anita Earl's name will be last on the ballot oh. in every place in the state. So I I want to end with this because these are the kind like we focus on, oh, Missouri has an ID law. Or oh, you know, um, you know, Texas has done something awful again with you know Latino voting rights or voter registration or redistricting. But one of the losses of Section Five coverage is that it's not the one big cut that you see because, like, when there's like a really awful law. Oh, everyone in this room knows about it. Washington Post writes about it, the New York Times writes about it, every group that's involved in it, right? The census, right? Everybody's got a lot. I mean, how many lawsuits are there about the census question? It's like, it's like every state, cities, groups, right? Everyone knows about it, and it's bad. But the problem is, without Section 5, there's no one who is minding the store when they are changing the ballot order. It is state Supreme Court race in North Carolina. So if there's one thing I'd ask all of you to do is like, don't just be on the lookout for the big stuff, but this little stuff matters. Now, how much does it matter? So if the average ballot order impact is about, let's say on the low end is 2%, okay? The following states in 2016 had a ballot order statute that put Donald Trump and the Republicans first on the ballot. Michigan? Florida, Missouri, uh, not well, just Missouri, but um, uh, and Wisconsin. Hillary Clinton lost all of those states by less than two percent. That's not to say that she would have won either way, but these kinds of things change. Like when Scott Walker changes a law, passes a law to change ballot order, assume he's doing it for a reason. Right, like it's not, it's not just because, hey, like well, this could be more convenient. So I'd ask you all to look out, not just for the big stuff, but for the little stuff, and bring those cases. Like bring them, you know, go publicize them, bring them pro bono, find the organizations, the ACLU, right here is raising lots of money. They'll bring them for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's very often not the little cases that, that will have Thank you, Jason, and thank you for inviting me to participate today. Um, I'd like to briefly outline, uh, from our perspective, uh, some of the threats that are seeing to voting rights um, and update you on some of the things we talked about last time. Um, but these suppression <laughs> tactics include, um, uh, these tactics include suppressing the voters we talked about before. I'm also going to talk about some of our responses. But they also include something new, or relatively new, uh, the, the role of technology, uh, particularly Facebook, Twitter, uh, in uh, what we consider to be suppressing the votes. We'll talk about that a little bit too. And finally, I'm going to touch on um, judicial nominations. You may have a uh, Supreme Court justice, who's a uh, Supreme Court nominee, who's uh, has just been uh, proffered. Uh, but also, we're really going to focus in on lower court judges uh, because those folks um, we take positions on have uh, recently uh, have really uh, scary and, and, and problematic voting rights records. Let's start with uh, where this all began. So I think it's fitting that uh, we're having this discussion just weeks after the fifth anniversary of the Shelby decision, and Jason touched on this. Um, the 2013 decision that uh, ended uh, and weakened the Voting Rights Act. Um, the uh, recent story of voting rights and voter suppression really began with that. Um, that decision permitted jurisdictions that once were covered by uh, Section 5 and Section 5, uh, John, is, John Tanner is here, a veteran who worked together at the DOJ. Um, you know, that covered jurisdictions mostly in the South, but jurisdictions that once had uh, the habit of discrimination and forced them 
there's been a voting change, as Mark mentioned, to the Department of Justice or to the District Court here in D.C. for approval. My mother, who grew up in the South, let's call that guilty until proven innocent. And that was good. That was a good thing uh, with those days. And uh, with, with the Shelby decision, they, they took that away. And in taking it away, they opened the door to attack the voting rights. And as a result, numerous states and local jurisdictions, such as Alabama, Texas, and North Carolina, imposed new discriminatory voting restrictions such as voter ID requirements, which we're going to talk about, uh, that would not have been allowed under Section 5. Uh, with the weakened Voting Rights Act, 14 states and probably many more now, uh, including some previously covered by Section 5, that new voting restrictions in place um, the first time in the 2016 presidential election. And that election was the first election uh, at the time of, uh, over, in over 50 years of full protection of the Voting Rights Act. And those changes had real consequences, uh, weakening and undermining voter turnout, and suppressing uh, the votes of individuals in states, such as North Carolina. Um, efforts to curtail voting rights only intensified after the election, and we've alluded to some of that. Uh, and in some states and the federal level, actors were working to undermine uh, democracy, making it hard for folks to vote at the state level. At least 20 states uh, are currently pursuing, and I think probably more than that now, uh, voting restrictions that would disproportionately impact African American voters. Uh, including voter, uh, voter ID schemes, eliminating candidate registration, cut to early voting, and purging voter rolls. And such laws do not include uh, new discriminatory restrictions in counties and municipalities at the local level. At the federal level, um, all of this is happening under what we call the new abnormal, uh, with the administration um, that uh, was president, that was, was advised by, by someone who gave voice to white nationalism, misogyny, xenophobia, and anti Muslim sentiment. And it's an administration that's actually still giving. Uh, voice to all of those, those sentiments. And it's one being led, uh, one that has the Justice Department being led by someone uh, uh, who at one point, Jeff Sessions, had, it showed a, a really consistent history of uh, and record of hostility towards uh, full rights, especially voting rights. And uh, the Department of Justice at one, at one point, while never perfect, was the department we could look to to be a partner in uh, helping to enforce the Voting Rights Act. And now we see there's an active uh, opponent We'll talk a little more about that as well. Um, such efforts uh, include, as again we talked about before, the president himself um, proffering false claims of rampant voter fraud, uh, always levying a disproportionate burden, which should always levy a disproportionate burden on minority voters. And when he does this, he it, it, we use the coded language, or not the coded language, illegal, uh, certain people being bussed in to vote. Um, we all know what that really means. And um, it's those kinds of tactics that we've seen historically being used as excuses to set up barriers for voters, particularly voters of color. Uh, and indeed, uh, he called for an investigation of the so-called voter fraud, and it led to uh, the so-called Voter Integrity Commission, we call it the Voter, voter uh, uh, Dis 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 Disenfranchisement Commission, or Voter Fraud Commission, um, led by Chris Kovach, to, uh, we think, manufacture a record for vote fraud to vindicate the president, but also to lay the groundwork for state and Congress to pass restrictions on voting rights. Shortly after its creation, many organizations, including the ACLU, the Lawyers Committee, and us, uh, brought lawsuits to stop it. Uh, a lot of those lawsuits quite appropriately focused on process, focused on uh, you know the structure and why it was wrong for them to uh, to, to to create this, uh, this, this this body under the APA or other. We focused on what we considered to be the, I don't know, the intentional uh, discrimination associated with um, the creation of. Thank you. Creation of the voting of, of this voter fraud commission, and we our, our tactic was um, that the comments of the president, the the actions of the president, the actions of the administration, really pointed to the fact that this commission was created with the intention of suppressing the votes of African Americans and Latinos. And I think you know that's endemic of who we are as an organization. We uh, see things with the race lens, and we see and are are, are unabashedly uh, willing to actually say what frankly, is the truth when it comes to things like this. Um, we see uh, in the context of this particular commission that in, in the face of that kind of opposition, in the face of, 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 of those lawsuits and, frankly, public pressure, he disbanded it. But that didn't stop uh, the Department of Justice from continuing, actually starting during that, that point, being complicit in, uh, in, in the kinds of suppression we've seen before. While the commission still existed, and we think actually in partnership with this commission, they sent a letter out to, uh, uh, to under the guise of the NVRA, to jurisdictions saying, you know, how are you um, uh, policing your voter rolls? When I was at DOJ, we would send letters out actually kind of taking a different tack, saying, how are you ensuring that your voter rolls or your voter voter uh, uh, your 
the systems of registering voters aren't doing it or aren't operating in a way to exclude people. They're basically saying, how are you making sure that you aren't allowing folks to vote abroad? And uh, the commission, as we all know, also asked for detailed information about voters, which again, many of us bought. So we see a DOJ once again in that context, but also in the context of switching sides uh, in our case, in the Warriors Committee case in Texas, the photo ID case we'll talk about, and I'll talk about very briefly, where um, we all had agreed, DOJ, Warriors Committee, LDF, that that was adopted with an intent to discriminate their photo ID scheme. Mark alluded to uh, having a, a new system photo ID scheme where one of the same students couldn't submit their, their ID, student IDs for, 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 for voting, but you could submit uh, a, a hunting license, so that was excluded, at, or included as an exception. Um, DOJ, on, I guess, while we were flying down in our, our initial argument, switched sides and said, no, no, it wasn't intended, intentional. And that was intended to undermine our, our, our ability to, uh, to hold Texas in to uh, Section 3 of the Voting Rights Act, and we, I'll talk a little more about that later on, uh, which would have required them, if we were successful when we were, to, to submit their voting changes in much the same way they had to under Section 5. So uh, just another example of how DOJ was that particular case, we said, changing its practice of looking at the NVRA in a way same as we did, which was not to put the burden on the voter to uh, to 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 prove that they shouldn't be uh, taken off the voter roll, which Ohio was doing, uh, but uh, but but put it on the jurisdiction to prove why it wants to be taken off. So we see a Jeff Sessions of DOJ that was that's really being an opponent now to 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 to, uh, to voting rights and then voter and voter uh, and advancing uh, advancing voter rights. Um, we also see that DOJ is being led by Jeff Sessions as said for someone who has a history uh, in Perry County, for example, bringing pumped uh, uh, up, <laughs> up vote fraud allegations against our clients in Perry County, uh, saying that they participated illegally in elections down there. Never found to be true. The court never found to be true. But, but the very the very idea of bringing busing folks in to be interviewed, busing folks in to be investigated, put a chill on voting rights. And that was our concern with with this, uh, with this commission, that's our ongoing concern with having Jeff Sessions uh, in, you know, at, at DOJ running uh, running the show. Um, in light of these sort of ongoing post Shelby efforts, um, you know, I think LDF other advocates have continued to vigorously enforce the enforce voting rights effect, such as Section 2, and really try to step into the shoes of DOJ and other uh, government agencies that once were allies in, 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 in protecting voting rights, and really become our own DOJs. Um, we see that in uh, the Texas photo ID case, which I alluded to. We see that uh, in, in, in the case that we brought against Alabama uh, challenging its uh, photo ID scheme. We see it in our successful uh, lawsuit against uh, Paragon County, Alabama, for the way, way it elects judges. Um, you know, the, the important feature of, of, of two of those three cases, the Texas case and the Paragon case, is again, and I'll, I mentioned this earlier, this idea that uh, the courts adopted that that these jurisdictions adopted these changes or adopted these voting schemes with the intent to discriminate. Under Section 3 of the Voting Rights Act, if you get a court to actually agree with you, uh, you can bring these jurisdictions back into the kind of review and, and, and consideration that they had to comply with under Section 5, which is significant. And it's a useful tool that we're seeing many organizations, including Maldeth and others, Lori Smitty was our partner in, uh, in, in the Texas case, uh, used. Uh, again, standing in the shoes of a, of a, of a DOJ that, that no longer seems interested in protecting voter rights. Um, with that, though, you know we see that um, Section Two still um, has its limits, and uh, we need to look no, no no farther back than the Texas redistricting case in this last term of the Supreme Court, where um, where where that case uh, basically said, despite showing that there was discrimination uh, under Section Two, uh, Texas was allowed to uh, to proceed. Uh, although during nearly eight years of litigation, the plaintiffs time and again met their burden showing that the challenge maps intentionally diluted African American and, and, and Latino voters, um, uh, they were allowed to proceed. Um, so while Section 2 is an equal tool, we know that we, um, we we sort of need other tools in place. That Section 5 was that tool, um, and that, now that's, that's sort of gone, or it is gone. Um, I think we uh, uh, are looking to uh, make sure that our members of Congress, as well as uh, those uh, at the uh, state and local levels, are not only not um, producing uh, legislation and schemes that would suppress votes, but also affirmatively passing legislation and affirmatively taking steps to open up the franchise in the wake of Section 5 being, uh, being gutted. Um, I want to quickly turn to uh, what we, the sort of potential features we saw, we've seen recently uh, or since the last election, 
uh, and that is the use of technology and these sort of platforms, uh, social media platforms, to suppress minority votes. Uh, we, along with others, have been deeply engaged uh, with, with Facebook and others to discuss um, uh, their role in, um, in what we consider to be um, uh, the use of that platform to suppress minority votes. Many of you will recall ads were purchased, uh, often uh, mischaracterizing uh, African American and other organizations, uh, often basically using the same kind of racial appeals which a lot of us have seen in our voting rights cases to 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 uh, to, to either turn to suppress turnout of African Americans and other other voters, or to to, to target uh, African American uh, uh, voters in the same way as I said before we've seen in our voting rights cases. Um, we partnered with uh, Muslim advocates and others to also lift up the proliferation of hate and hate speech on 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 these platforms and really try to infuse again a racial justice uh, discussion into it. And sometimes it comes to the discussion of data and privacy as if they're somehow uh, uh, not at all uh, contained or contaminated with a, with a with racial bias, frankly, and, and how they execute their plans. Uh, we've been successful in bringing Facebook to, uh, to, a, to a realization that they need to actually look at their own uh, policy. They've hired uh, consultants to help them do that in the, in the same way that the Airbnb it has pursued uh, uh, that, that process, and we're interested in continuing to work with them, uh, perhaps even sometimes in an adversarial way, to make sure that they, they use their, their, uh, their platform in a way that does not discriminate, that is not used in a discriminatory manner. Um, I mentioned before um, what we think Congress can do, and I think, you know, it has to be also seen in the context of what Congress uh, has said they want to do. So in, in, the, in, the, in the wake of Charlottesville, a lot of, 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 of outpouring of opposition to the obvious outpouring of hate uh, and, and, and what happened down there. Many resolutions were passed. Um, we need more than that. We actually need Congress to step up and actually uh, pass legislation that restores the Voting Rights Act, restores Section 5, expands the franchise. There are many bills we can talk about in either question and answer. Um, but also, we need Congress and everyone to recognize the truth of voter suppression. Um, and that's really a tool of white supremacy. And that's a tool of white supremacy, whether it's uh, 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 whether it was used uh, in the context of literacy tests, uh, confusing registration requirements, or even in the redistricting process. And that realization, I think, would drive, uh, hopefully, uh, some sincere uh, responses to what we've seen uh, in the last election and since in terms of how the voting system has been used to suppress uh, minority votes. I'm going to quickly turn to um, uh, uh, judicial, uh, uh, judicial, not judicial elections, uh, judicial uh, uh, nominations. And you know, I think oftentimes uh, uh, nominating judges sort of flies under the radar. Uh, we sometimes uh, uh, think we're wonky. We sometimes think it's not something that we should be engaged in because they're judges and we're litigators. Um, it's, 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 it, it, however, is it's critical. These are lifetime appointments. I'm now 53 years old, and while I think it's exciting to have people think that that's young for a judge, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it is daunting to think that I'm on the bubble. That, <laughs> In my lifetime, uh, we may not have another opportunity to, to fill seats that are being filled right now by this administration. And I have to say, this administration has proper folks um, who have a, a, a serious um, a history, serious record of, of, of discrimination, uh, not discrimination, but a serious uh, a record of, of, of hostility towards civil rights. And I'm going to talk about three folks who have that kind of record and kind of civility rights. We have Thomas Farr who's been nominated for the Eastern District of North Carolina, which we've taken the extraordinary step of opposing, uh, who um, uh, not only was the go-to person to uh, sort of defend North Carolina's voter suppression tactics, but part of Bessie Helms uh, back in the day uh, to uh, help uh, put forward the, as many of you remember, the, the postcards that uh, falsely uh, uh, told African Americans, if you turn out to vote, you're going to be prosecuted. Um, not only that, but he seemed to have misled Congress, frankly, uh, and, the, and the Senate Judiciary Committee in, in, in explaining all of that. We wanted him to come back for, 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 for another hearing to explain all of that. Uh, Congress disagreed. Uh, so he's still being considered. We have Mark Norris, who uh, is being supported for a district court position in Tennessee, who supports Tennessee's um, strict voter ID law, very strict voter ID law, which went, went to a place, went to effect in 2012. Um, federal district courts around the country recently found and said before that uh, um, these kinds of ID laws are, 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 have been found to be discriminatory, and he has supported one in, in Tennessee. And we have Andrew Oldham, who uh, really reflects, I think, uh, sort of a, a turning point in sort of how they're looking at some of these, these, 
these uh, these nominees are looking at folks who have come up through or coming through um, a, a politicized uh, process within the state AG's office, either as solicitor generals or as attorney generals or people who work with them, and, and representing these states in rather uh, ex extreme conditions. So for Mark. Uh, for, uh, uh, for 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 uh, for this nominee um, uh, Andrew Oldham representing um, uh, 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 Alabama in uh, opposition to the Shelby case, and what was interesting about that opposition was he sort of used Alabama's photo ID um, uh, for Alabama's um, uh, 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 process for for uh, for for he considered to be uh, setting up discriminatory uh, voting system as an example as to why Section Five should not be. Uh, should not be should not be uh, uh, continued and, and their support for Shelby. Um, so I so I urge everyone to, to weigh in, engage, uh, look at these nominees very closely, uh, including obviously uh, the new nominee to, to the Supreme Court, and require and, and ask Congress to have voting rights and, and, and issues that we've been discussing, discussing today be on the table for questions um, and not normalize. Behavior we're seeing from this administration in terms of voter suppression, but also in terms of who they nominate to be judges, not to normalize that in our system, uh, and not to normalize what we're unfortunately seeing as judges not being willing to endorse primary support of education. Stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Jason, and thanks to the ADA for inviting the Lawyers Committee to sit at this table today to talk about voting rights. Uh, I want to focus on some of the work we're doing in Georgia because it addresses some of the concerns about what's happening at the micro level, at the city level, and at the county level that often fly under the radar screen. Um, one case in particular happened in the wake of the Shelby County decision where Hancock County, Georgia, which is a um, rural community in middle Georgia, very poor, majority black, um, had a election superintendent for many years who was the first black probate judge in the state of Georgia, Judge Edith Ingram. And she ran the elections just fine, everything was going well. And a small pocket of majority white voters around the lakes, uh, Lake Sinclair and Hancock County decided they didn't like Judge Ingram running the election. So they lobbied the Georgia legislature to enact a board of elections in Hancock County. And the ultimate act that was adopted uh, called for the appointment of two Republican members to the board, two Democratic members to the board, and a fifth person that would be selected by the local judge. So in this scenario, what happened was Hancock County wound up with a majority white election board. With two white Republicans and the third Republic, white Republican that was appointed by the local judge. That meant that the white block on the election board basically ran the elections in the county. What happened in the wake of Shelby County was in the run up to the 2015 Sparta municipal election, there were some white candidates that decided to challenge the, the black mayor and longtime black incumbents on the city council. And what the Board of Elections decided to do, certain members decided to challenge black voters in the city of Sparta. Um, and ultimately what happened was there were at least 187 uh, voter challenges that were filed against the 988 registered voters in the city of Sparta, the vast majority of whom were black. <laughs> and what, what the challenges involved were um, instances where one of the white Board of Elections members actually went into the community, looked at how many people were registered to vote at certain locations, and decided upon herself that there were too many people living in some of these buildings, ignoring multi-generational families living together and poor people living together because of their economic circumstances. So that was one of the focuses of the challenge. Another focus was that she'd go around to the uh, vicinity and see if people were living in places that did not look habitable, such as trailers or um, buildings that were not kept up to her standards and decided those were abandoned um, buildings or trailers. So she challenged the voters as having moved from those locations. 
then after the challenges would come on to the Board of Elections agenda, this person on the Board of Elections who had brought the challenges would go take her place at the board seat and then rule on her own challenges along with the other board members. This ultimately did not sit well with the community there and questions started being raised about the fairness of the process. So instead of the challenges going forward in this manner, uh, a white member of the community was recruited to start the challenges on his own with the assistance of this board member. So what happened was they go out into the community, claim that people had moved from their homes and file challenges. Then the board would have the sheriff's department issue summonses and go out to the community and serve voters with summonses telling them that they had to appear on three days notice to who they were eligible to vote in the county. This resulted in a series of 12 challenge hearings where ultimately uh, 85 people were challenged, 53 people were removed from the voter rolls. And this was in advance of this hotly contested municipal election in Sparta where ultimately one of the white male challengers to the, um, for the mayor position won the election. We ultimately uh, filed suit under um, the NVRA and under um, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Under the NVRA, uh, people cannot be challenged ha as having moved unless um, they actually have moved and told um, the election board that they moved or under the NVRA's uh, address confirmation uh, process where they are given written notice failed to respond to the written notice in 30 days. And then after the passage of two federal election cycles, uh, after they've been put in inactive status can be uh, purged from the rolls. That's what happened in Ohio in the Houston case, uh, the purge process that they used there. Uh, so people were being removed prematurely, not being put on the inactive list, and were taken off supposedly because they moved. Uh, so that was a clear violation of the MVRA, plus we had the racial component on the Section 2 claim. Uh, we uh, drew a conservative judge in the Middle District of Georgia who, um, I have to say, was not horrible on this case. Um, he kept a tight leash on discovery, so a lot of the work we had to do on the case was through Open Records Act requests rather than formal discovery and um, through other processes. Ultimately, we were able to prove that 25 of the voters actually lived in the county which had never been challenged or removed from the rolls. Two of the people had passed away uh, during this process, so uh, they could not be restored. And ultimately, um, 25 of the purge voters, uh, the court ordered restored to the rolls. Subsequently, we reached a consent settlement with the county where all of the purge voters were put into an active status that they were not uh, reinstated to the roles. So we accomplished what they would have gotten under the NVRA had they been given proper notice in the first place. Um, so that's just one example of something that's happening on the local level in the post Shelby world, where if, if we hadn't heard about this through our partners in the community, this county and this board probably would have gotten away with this. Um, but there were active people in the community who kept their ear to the ground and were able to find um, help with the Warriors Committee and with other organizations in Georgia. Um, that case is also important because as part of the consent order, uh, the defense agreed to continuing court supervision. And a, a person was recently appointed as the examiner, which is sort of a function of a monitor uh, to the case, who will, who will monitor list maintenance processes and voter challenges going forward for the duration of the consent order. Another thing that's happening frequently in Georgia are precinct consolidations and precinct location changes um, and polling location closures. And the reason why this is important and to keep an eye on is because in many cases we've been finding that the precincts and polling locations are being targeted and uh, minority communities and in uh, communities where people don't have ready access to public transportation or um, are able to get to remote polling places. Um, so far in Georgia, there have been at least 10 jurisdictions post Shelby that have tried to um, 
significantly reduce the number of polling locations for their voters. Um, so we've been pretty successful along with the groups on the ground in preventing that from happening, but there's 159 counties in Georgia and it's hard to keep track of all of those counties and what they're doing. And when these polling plates and recent consolidation plans go on the agenda, the public notices that are given are very vague. They'll say, you know, we're going to move such and such a poll location to a different poll location with no explanation of why or what the distance is or what the impact will be on the voters. Or they're even vaguer where they just give, um, I don't know, a, a number and say we're going to have a plan number heard talking about precinct consolidation. So people are not getting notified in advance of these hearings about these important considerations that will affect their ability to cast ballots on election day. The case that Jason um, mentioned earlier that the Lawyers Committee brought last year uh, involved um, specifically this uh, CD6 uh, runoff election involving John Ossoff and Karen Handel. In Georgia, like many Southern states, uh, there's a majority vote requirement that requires a candidate to get more than 50% of the vote in order to be elected. Otherwise, they have to go to a runoff election uh, to have that determination made. And in Georgia, like some other states, what happens in the runoff scenario is that there's a registration deadline that is 28 days before the main election, either the special election, the primary election, or the general election. And then Georgia, under the existing law at the time, uh, considered runoff elections to be a continuation of that election. In other words, they didn't consider the runoff to be a completely separate election. So they would not allow people to register to vote after the special primary or general election uh, to vote in the runoff. In the case of the runoff election involving uh, John Ossoff and Karen Handel, that meant that if voters in Georgia in the CD6 uh, district election had not registered by April, um, March 20th for the April 18th election, they were precluded from voting in the election that occurred on June 20th, months away. And so that's the clear violation of Section 8 of the MVRA. The, NVRA provides that states are precluded from having voter registration deadlines in excess of 30 days before a federal election. So we sent out a NVRA notice letter to the Secretary of State pointing out this clear violation of federal law. Got no response from soon. Uh, we, we pulled the conservative judge in the Northern District of Georgia and were successful in obtaining a preliminary injunction that opened up the voter registration for the CD6 runoff election um, uh, in June. Ultimately, we settled the case with a consent order that expands that protection now to all federal runoff elections in Georgia. Another case that we recently um, litigated in Georgia involved uh, what they called the exact match voter registration system. And as Mark said earlier, Beginning after uh, President Obama's election in 2008, states started looking at ways to make it more difficult for minority voters to register and vote. This was one example. In Georgia, uh, the Secretary of State, Brian Kemp, who is now running for governor of the state, um, decided to enact an administrative protocol that required when people registered to vote that the information on their voter registration form exactly match information about them either on the state's um, driver services database where people get their driver's licenses or against the Social Security Administration's HAVV voter registration verification system. And if there was one digit off, somebody has a hyphen in their name on one uh, database and not on their application or vice versa, or someone has an apostrophe in their name, and it wasn't on the database record or the clerk entered the information wrong when they registered to vote, they would not match. And under the existing system before the lawsuit, if those voters didn't respond to a written notice within 30 days, their application would be canceled, which meant that they would have to register all over again, probably face the same 
these circumstances yet again and be in this never ending sort of hamster wheel where they would not get on the voter rolls. So we filed the challenge to that under <laughs> the fundamental rights of vote theory and under section two because this process has been shown since its adoption in 2009 to have disenfranchised many, many tens of thousands of minority registrants. Um, so ultimately the state, the Secretary of State agreed to a settlement prior to the 2016 general election that allowed people to cure this issue at the polling place. Uh, previously, what would happen if people got notified and didn't correct the problem before the registration deadline, they would have no recourse. They wouldn't be able to vote in that upcoming election at all. So under the settlement, they're able to show ID or some form of um, proof that they are who they are, their identity, which is the important thing, and can vote on election day. Another offshoot of that process was that under the Georgia Driver Services Records um, retention policy, they would register people to vote or register people when they got their driver's licenses as non-citizens if they had green cards and obtained a temporary driver's license in Georgia. Those records are not automatically updated um, by the driver services department in Georgia. So if you first got your driver's license in Georgia as a non-citizen, that record stays there until you proactively figure out that you need to update that information with driver services. <clears throat> so what also happened under the exact match system was that people would uh, go through a naturalization ceremony, become a naturalized citizen, be thrilled to register to vote at the naturalization ceremony, only to receive a letter a very short time later accusing them of not being a citizen and trying to register to vote. That was very intimidating for people who had just become U.S. citizens to have this accusation made that they're trying to register as a non-citizen. And so ultimately what the Secretary of State agreed to do was to allow people to offer proof of, that they were citizens and able to vote on election day <clears throat> or before. <clears throat> um, and what, what happened ultimately is that many people were able to do this process in time to vote in the 2016 general election. We worked out the details of the settlement uh, during the ensuing months after the election and finally inked the settlement agreement and uh, enshrining this process and the um, consent agreement being reached on the settlement. Minutes later, or days later, after signing the settlement agreement, the Georgia legislature endeavored to basically undermine the settlement uh, by bringing um, HB 268 during the 2017 legislative session. Our settlement, by the way, did not give voters an outside um, deadline by which to cure the exact match issues of it. It didn't matter if they did it within 30 days or forever, they could take care of that problem, problem at any point in time. So when the Georgia legislature and the governor finally got finished monkeying around with the settlement and through legislation, they put an end date of 26 months. Uh, we've gone back and seen that this process is continuing to disenfranchise minority voters and you will not be hearing the last of our involvement in this issue in Georgia. But these are just some examples of how either on the local level, on the state level, states and election officials are doing things that are preventing people from registering to vote, targeting minority communities, erecting barriers that are completely unnecessary. And I think you're only gonna see more of this. And it's very important for people in the states to keep their ears to the ground and to reach out to organizations like the Lawyers Committee and LDF and ACLU and others um, to help them when these um, problems arise. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we're going to open it up to questions in a couple of minutes. Uh, and for those that are uh, watching from your computer, you can submit questions and I will uh, hopefully be able to get those and ask the panel. Um, just a couple questions to start. Um, we obviously have another election coming up. We always have an election. Um, which states do you think are, are sort of prime real estate for problems coming up? Uh, we've talked about Georgia, we've talked about Kansas, we've talked about Texas, North Carolina. 
Are there particular states that maybe we haven't talked about yet where you have your eye on? There might have been new laws, there might be some confusion uh, that voters might have uh, this year. Anybody can join Well, I would, you know, I think, you know, part of the limitations of litigation is that you, know, you can have cases pending for a very long time when elections occur. So I think, just in general, I think all the states we've been talking about where there's a team this place, North Carolina, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, there's going to be confusion no matter what. So even if we were even successful, there's going to be decent education happening at the evil of what the, you know, the new regime is, whether it's discriminatory or not. But I would, I would put on the list of Texas, even though we now have a remedy there for making our case, um, largely because I think of the potential for, for, for problems with folks are, are always going to be educating people to, to uh, make sure they understand the photo ID, you know, Remedies is there. I think Alabama, you know, we challenged Alabama's photo ID uh, law. We were not successful with some of the appeal. Um, we think we're going to be successful on appeal, but right now that's still in place. North Carolina is back at it again. They are trying to pass another photo ID requirement, I guess, in time for the next election, but put them on the list. Um, Ohio, you know, because of who said it's a lot of continuous purging uh, process, and it's unclear to me uh, exactly how that will play out. Um, so I think, you know, we need to keep our eye on probably every one of the states we've highlighted, um, but then just be vigilant about uh, opportunities and, and, and sort of new opportunities that states like North Carolina will take to uh, I'd add three, three other states. Uh, that's sort of new, new entrants, uh, or renewed entrants. Uh, Florida, um, you know, Florida, there is, right now, I'm suing Florida over ballot order, I'm also doing that they they, this, they have early vote centers. The Secretary of State has issued an opinion that early vote centers can be located in any public building except public buildings on college campuses. So it can be in a library, it can be in a county office, it can't be in a building at the University of Florida or Florida State. Um, so we're suing over over that. Um, uh, the other state that I'd, I'd add, you know, there have been two relatively significant lawsuits um, that a little bit have flown under the radar screen in Indiana. Uh, the NAACP brought a very important case involving Marion County uh, and um, uh, and early vote uh, uh, access. Um, I brought a case in Lake uh, in Lake County. Indiana. The state or the state of Indiana passed a law that required half of the polls in Lake County, Indiana, to be closed. To consolidate, to your point about poll consolidation, um, Lake County is the home of Gary, Indiana. I, I sort of hypothesized that if you were Republicans in Indiana and you were trying to inconvenience black voters to the maximum extent possible without inconveniencing white voters, like because there are large Relative by Indiana standards, a relatively large uh, African American population in, uh, in Indianapolis, in Marion County, but there are also a ton of white folks. But Gary is like your perfect place where you could like just target um, uh, the maximum of black voters without without getting the repercussions of sort of the wealthy suburb and you know white uh, green counties of Indianapolis. Um, so we sued. Uh, on that, and actually, um, the state sort of gave up. They said, "Okay, we're not going to, we're not going to do that." Um, I, I think it was too transparent, even by by their standards, to to, to, to defend uh, for 2018. Uh, and then the the last state is is Arizona. Arizona is an interesting state. Arizona has been doing terrible things to Hispanic voters uh, for years, um, uh, and uh, there have been a series of elections which may make things better there. The, the, obviously, Sheriff Joe Arpaio lost his election as only as a sheriff. Um, uh, a woman named Helen Purcell, uh, who was the uh, minister of elections in Maricopa County, also lost her election and has been replaced by a much uh, fairer uh, administrator of administrative elections. So that may solve some of the problems in Arizona, but Arizona. Um, this is a great example of election fines. So 
Arizona came up with this idea that they would make it. So Arizona has uh, a dollar, has push vote by mail. So about 60 to 70 percent of Arizonans vote by mail uh, in uh, in the state. And while before Shelby County, they passed, they pushed a scheme that would make it a crime, okay, not an infraction, a crime. To, um, for anyone other than the voter themselves to transmit a completed mail ballot to the post office. Okay, so just to get this straight, you fill out a vote by mail ballot, he fills out a vote by mail ballot, I can't carry his ballot to the post office without committing a crime. DOJ is like, wait a second, <laughs> yeah, this goes to, this goes to Protection by the DOJ asks the question. So the legislature reverses course and withdraws the bill. The week after Shelby County comes down, they reintroduce the bill and they pass it, except now it's a five-year ballot. So now you go to jail for five years if you if you transmit someone else's ballot. Um, so there's a you know, so that's a law that's being challenged. Um, I can tell you from my work in doing recounts. Um, our, I, and this may not be, someone's going to look this up and find out that I'm wrong, but I'm, if I'm wrong, it's by, by one or two. I, I would bet you that Arizona has the highest percentage of rejected signature match ballots in the country. I mean, it's like, it's a crazy number of people who cast the ballot, believe that they have done everything right, and the ballot never gets counted because the signature this uh, local official judges that the signature on the envelope doesn't match the signature on file for the voter registration. Um, it particularly is uh, hits Hispanic voters hard. I don't, I'm not aware, I, I, I don't think there are laws depending on that issue, but um, are there in Arizona? In, in Arizona, oh, no. Yeah, no, elsewhere there are. But so like, I, I, Arizona is the other place I would look at because it's like, it's one of these places where we go and like, oh yeah, you know, Arizona's they kind of over screwing the over minority voters. Um, but the local election officials are so awful. So hopefully it'll get better a little bit by litigation, a little bit by better people in higher elections. Um, uh, add, your, so, add your states. Yeah, no, but this will be pretty quick. Uh, this is actually, a, uh, I think, a, a dodge to that question or, or a non-direct answer. It'll be a little more and, and, uh, ambiguous because I think this responds to something that I, uh, both Julie um, uh, and Todd and Mark were saying, which is that there, the, the, the real problem with the assault on voting rights is that it's this hyper-local issue that can be happening everywhere, anywhere under the radar. And why Section 5 was such a critical tool is that it, 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 it just provided a buffer. It provided a way to make sure that mischief wouldn't happen. And so the way that I look at a case, because I, I think I think everyone is, like Chris Kobach, the case that I've described to you that I've spent two years litigating intensely, is a symptom of a much larger national problem. And the reason to bring a lawsuit like that against this sort of you know, used car salesman in chief is to get the public to understand the stakes and to say that it doesn't stop with this one sort of <laughs> sketchy dude who you probably can't trust and read that inspection and divide and help him in court for various lies that he's made in, in various ways. It's something that you need to be skeptical about in all of the states and even beyond the states in these sort of minor municipalities and school board elections that we litigate and in other areas. And I think some, we, we know for, for various reasons that in this particular landscape, there's gonna be limited relief that we can get from the court uh, ultimately, at least in the near term, the long near term. I'm throwing out my phone. I'm thinking of, you know, like, you know, uh, cosmic timelines, I guess, right now. But the, so that, that's, that's uh, a big problem. But if you can win the people by highlighting sort of some of the critical mischief that is happening with some of these key cases, then there are uh, remedies that you can seek through Congress, through state legislatures, to push back on a lot of these issues. So that, that is my dodge answer, but that's why I think we need a combination of uh, work in these 
on these under the radar issues uh, alongside this really critical kind of exposure of some of the architects behind the, this massive attack on both parts of that sense. I would also add on to Mark's um, nomination for Florida because Florida saw a large uh, number of people coming to the state from Puerto Rico as a result of the hurricane um, issues there. And believe it or not, there are people in government in Florida and Congress who don't realize that they have the right to vote in Florida for um, state and congressional and presidential elections. So um, I think we're going to see some problems around um, these people being able to register and to vote uh, possibly in the upcoming election. Okay, we're going to open up to questions. I have Last question. Uh, I have a microphone that I can pass around, so just make sure that uh, you're talking in the microphone. Thank you all. Thank you all. litigation of whether his interstate prospect program has also been defanged or maybe it's too late because he's been inculcated in the secretaries and GOP secretaries of state. It's like uh, Ossoff's uh, handle. He was, he, uh, as I understand it, but uh, anyway, that's my question. I think it could be to anyone as well. Yeah, so I can uh, talk a little bit about that. And I think you're right to say that the, the, the I mean, Chris Cohen is the architect of a whole variety of strategies, some of which uh, Mark ha has detailed in much of it, has mentioned in, in various ways. And the lawsuit that we have brought against him in Kansas is really just one of many tactics that are available. We do actually have a lawsuit in Indiana, which is about some of the cross check purchases that we won an initial uh, victory on with our uh, colleagues before. Potentially skeptical judge uh, and on good grounds, um, and that, that, that the Brennan Center has also brought a, a consolidated suit alongside that. So that is just one state's uh, efforts to do that. So each state has kind of different versions of, of doing the, the cross check system, and uh, my colleagues have been actively engaged in that effort. And so I think that I think that um, it is. Uh, <laughs> I, it, it's it's too it's too great to say that we have banged uh, Chris Kobanke is going to go very deep into the establishment in a lot of ways, but there are a lot of tools we still have to push back against it. And even one thing that is kind of cool, I guess, just about explaining how radioactive a personality like that should be is in the sense of this litigation. The legislative, this is the litigation over the fact that there's been uh, an immigration question that's been added. It's, it's relatively clearly targeted, we think, at immigration communities to, to lower uh, vote counts in uh, democratic leaning states with large immigration populations. Um, but there's a, there, the, the, the government has said, oh, well, we're doing this just so we can enforce our, you know, Voting Rights Act uh, responsibilities, which is, again, a really questionable pretext. But the legislative record is just, it's kind of awesome because it has emails from Chris Kobach and others saying, hey, you should do this because I think these Democratic states have too high populations. So it's great to sort of, I think, there, there are a variety of ways, I think, once we push back on the various actors in the sphere to highlight some of the mischief that they're up to. And as I said in, my, in response to my last question, I still think it's just the first step. The most important thing is the people. I think we need massive legislative reform on a bipartisan basis to uh, have a new Voting Rights Act that will address a whole range of these issues. Is that a pie in the sky? Yes, but I think that's our best hope. Uh, so can I just take 20 yep. seconds because um, it's now been said by uh, by two people. Um, if you want a new Voting Rights Act, elect Democrats to the majority of the House and the Senate. For the okay, this idea that like it, it's not even pie in the sky. It's like pie out in another planet. Like the Republicans are never passing a Voting Rights Act. Like not in this, not not in my lifetime. What is it? The life of 
including my child's lifetime plus 22 <laughs> years. Like, 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 it's just, it just, they're, they're never going to do it. So I know that it's hard for nonpartisan organizations to get into politics, and I totally, and I totally get that. And, and, but, but let's be clear-eyed about the problem. If, if right now you had a, a Democratic president and a Democratic speaker and a Democratic uh, majority leader uh, setting aside the filibuster, um, we would have a new voting rights act. Um, there's only, and it would be supported by 100% of the caucus of, of, of those of the Democratic Party. Yeah. 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 I, I'd like to thank all of you and ask each of the panelists of uh, the extent to which you have asked for Section 3 relief in your complaints and your thinking about that. Well, I can start. I mean, that was, um, we asked for it in the Texas photo ID case. Um, and the story behind that is, um, you know, Section 3 requires an intent finding uh, in order to be brought under it. Uh, and Section 3, for those you don't know, requires jurisdictions if the intentional discrimination is found in voting to basically come under the same kind of scrutiny they would, they would come under under Section 5. Um, and uh, I think I may have mentioned that um, on our way from Danae Nelson's way down to argue the case, some iteration five district courts have found uh, Texas photo ID being unconstitutional and a violation of Section 2. So, so she's been down there a lot arguing this. And one of her iterations down there shortly after her sentence took over, DOJ switched sides. And that was purely designed to undermine that that claim. Uh, so that's that case. And another case, the Terrebonne case, which is the our challenge to Terrebonne Parish's uh, Louisiana. Terrebonne Parish, Louisiana's um, method of electing judges, we won after eight day trial. Part of that case, the reason why we brought an intent claim was so that they would be under section three jurisdiction. And you know, we're now in the process of, of finding a remedy that would include that. In our Hancock County case in Georgia, we would have amended the complaint to include Section 3. Ultimately, we settled by getting court supervision, so um, we felt that we got close to what we would have gotten under Section 3. The thing I would do about Section 3 at this point is obviously the person who would be doing scrutiny <laughs> is Sessions. Um, but, you know, we're, we're talking a long game here, and, um, and so you know, there's also the court option. Thanks again to you all coming. Um, I didn't have a question um, for the entire panel. You did speak to there being, well, I, really, is there any room for moderation within um, looking to regulate as far as voter rights, as well as making sure only people who are legally eligible to vote actually vote? You spoke to um, there being the idea that one person was uh, incorrectly registered and just the idea that one person being able to um, wear there's an opportunity for the voter fraud to be available. Don't you think it is happening? And how could you balance such a thing? Yeah, I, I can, and I think some of that was directed at some of the statements that I made. And, and I think you're, you're, that is a, a, absolutely a legitimate question. The thing that I want to emphasize, and some of this comes out through the trial, seeing the trial, and I'm not saying no, you should read the transcript of the trial, but there, all of the experts that we put forward in our case said voter fraud does happen, but it happens really, really, really rarely. And there are much, much simpler ways to address it that don't result in tens of thousands of individuals being registered. And I think that's why the judge believed our experts. They were saying it never, ever possibly could occur. There's nothing you can ever do about it. So ignore it when it happens. It's instead saying the medicine is killing the patient rather than, than uh, treating this kind of small rash in a way. And what, what else, and, and I don't know if this is a satisfactory answer to you or not, but one thing that I thought was really a powerful part of the trial in Kansas is that there, we had an expert named, um, uh, I'm forgetting his name, even though Eitan Nerds, you'll be mad at me if I say that. The, uh, the, uh, and he, he looked at the registration rules and found that 
Kansas only produced 39 uh, non citizens who were on the registration rolls over 20 years, but there actually were 400 individuals who were registered before they were born. That means that there was a weird error in the system that had individuals who had a registration date before they actually were born. Now, was there a conspiracy by parents to pre-register their ineligible children before <laughs> the date that they were uh, they were going to reach the age of majority? <laughs> probably not. Probably it was an administrative mistake that every state's database has across the country, and there are ways to kind of review that to ensure that you've got a system that is viable and that has real um, election integrity. One thing I'll say, and this is this is a little. I, 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 I may start to sound paranoid because our security, our national security people are particularly concerned about this. There are worries about election integrity. You may recall that in 2016, a foreign state hacked into, attempted to hack into a large number of, of state and national local databases to see what they could do. There's no addressing that problem. We don't even really know what the scope of that is right now. So the, the real concern is if you're highlighting numbers like 30 individuals, who many of whom said, I, this was a mistake, please don't register me, then we're worried that people who are highlighting those errors have a separate agenda. They're trying to weaponize anti-immigrant sentiment. They're trying to use that as a tool to gain political advantage. And that is the thing that I think the judges are, that, that all of us should be concerned about. We shouldn't pretend as if it is impossible for fraud to occur. Is that, is that enough of an answer? Let me, let me add to that. Your, your, your answer was very polite and very measured. I will say <laughs> that there's room for moderation if one looks at that. And I think the reason why folks aren't looking at the facts isn't because they're ignorant of the facts. They're looking, not looking at the facts because vote fraud is used as a proxy for discrimination, for political purposes, but discrimination. Fraud, vote fraud was, was, a, was a bug that we put out to include African Americans who vote. That's why we had special rules for African Americans. How many, how many fairies to dance at the top of a pin? You know, uh, give me the, recite the Constitution of the state of Georgia. All of that had proxy of vote fraud. Was political power at the bottom of that? Yes, it was political power based on race. And so I think you're right, anti-immigrant sentiment is at the whole heart of it, but it's also, and race is at the heart of it, but it's at the heart of it. And the reason why we're not following up on what really happened in this election that involved vote fraud and vote, and voter, uh, black voter integrity is because of that. The president decided instead of focusing on that, the very real powerful manipulation of Facebook, Twitter, and others, to exclude African Americans and others from the voter roll. Instead of focusing on that, this administration trumped up, I can't keep using that word, trumped <laughs> up vote fraud to justify spending lots of money on a voter fraud commission designed to do nothing but create false data and false information. So all of that sort of to me sets up this idea that there must be something else going on, another agenda going on, which is to exclude people of color from the poll, period. That's why our case had intentional discrimination as its component at its heart. Because it's not just some benign system just happening. It's because people decide that, well, we want there are certain people, people of color, we don't want at the poll for whatever reason. And that is at the core, frankly, of, of white supremacy in this country. That's always the reason why they exclude people of color. And so I think what we need to do in terms of getting to your point about moderation is sort of team up and understand the arc of history as to why vote fraud is put out there. They don't put vote fraud out there for any other reason than to exclude people of color from the polls. And I think the, 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 the thing that's exciting about your, your case is this idea of what is legally, what, what is legal vote fraud? That's intent, intent. And if you change the definition for only because you want to exclude people of color, again, that's discrimination. And if we get to, again, why, what vote fraud is, which is actually intent, we know that those 39 people would not be charged with vote fraud. And we know that we're more likely to be struck by lightning to see the kind of vote fraud that Chris Kovaches and others are putting forward. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm happy to moderate, happy to be a, a partner for anyone who wants to actually have an honest discussion. But so far, no one has stepped forward to want to have an honest discussion. And I think that that's because for the reason that I said, when you put vote fraud out there, you're doing it for a reason. And you're doing it so that you can step systems to exclude people of color from the polls. I think we have time for one more question. Um, 
volunteers in D.C. as well as in um, the state, most, most of the states in the South that we uh, work in, as well as other jurisdictions, so people will be able to sign up for those trainings. We have electionprotection.org website and also our uh, Lawyers Committee.org website where you can get additional information about those volunteer opportunities. And we run a program called, we partner with Lawyers Committee as well, we run a program called Prepare to Vote, where we're actually on the ground, we just employ our lawyers to the state's holding elections, for example, in Alabama, down there. And so I think that if you're interested in participating and, and you know, being involved, you know, I, I'll give you my card, you can email me, and I can let you know where we will be, what states we're going to target. We don't have an unlimited number of staff to go to, get, go to the go to be on the ground, but I can let you know where we will be. And the only thing I'll add to this is, as, as was mentioned uh, at the outset, I, following 2016, I helped create now chair of the board of an organization of a nonprofit called We the Action, um, which uh, is an online platform where progressive lawyers can sign up and be and find opportunities to do work for progressive causes, whether that relates to elections or relates to choice or relates to immigrant rights. Um, uh, it's really a, a great platform and it has partnered with the lawyers committee so that if you want to sign up for the lawyers committee and you're part of We the Action, you can do so uh, uh, if you're Opportunities, like I said, outside of voter protection as well. It's a good, uh, it's a good resource to generate. Right. And I would be remiss if I didn't add to that. Um, if you're not a member of the ABA, join the ABA. If you're a member <laughs> of ABA, join the Civil Rights and Social Justice section. Uh, you can sign up for the Civil Rights Committee. They would not allow me back up here if I didn't say this. But it is very important. Um, we tackle the issues like voting rights, police misconduct. Um, healthcare, immigrant rights, uh, and we try to take ideas from our members as well. Uh, so I think uh, these are all fantastic options. Uh, hopefully everyone learns something today and, and uh, for the folks that choose to get involved, uh, have a good path forward to getting involved. Um, thank you to everyone for coming out and joining us online and um, have a great day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Most importantly, thank you for our panel. They did all the heavy lifting.